Hello, sunshine, and welcome to a very special edition of the State of the Union podcast. Alongside me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, and joining us here in studio, live, the one and only Greg Berhalter, the head coach of the U.S. men's national team. Welcome, Greg. Before we start, uh, last week, Mossy came in to the show, and he was just absolutely crazy, excited, and happy having visited this restaurant, Bestia, is that what you called it? Uh, he hyped it up. So you come into town, and last night, we took you to Bestia, all right? He, he has, he's already made his feelings that it is one of the great dining experiences. He's a big foodie, okay? How did you like the uh, dinner last night? I loved it. I really? It was, yeah, I thought it was great. We, we talked, the crowd was amazing, the food was amazing, the variety of dishes, the different flavors, that bone marrow pasta, spinach pasta, my goodness. Speaking your, you language. Like Speaking your language. Speaking your language. My goodness, <laughs> that was good. I did not particularly <laughs> enjoy it, okay? Uh, I thought it was too loud, okay? And I know I'm grumpy old manning a, l- a little bit here. And most importantly, you know, I'm a big guy, all right? It takes fuel to fuel this machine here. I thought the, the portions were too small, and I left hungry and grumpy after it. Left, let me ask you so. Literally and figuratively. Was, yes. that the, was that a question of the ordering, or was that the food? It could right? have been the ordering. Could have been the ordering. Who ordered? Stu ordered. Stu Holden ordered. Okay, so that's yeah, a problem. All right, well, listen, uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you are here. You're actually here. You're going to go to the uh, MLB uh, All-Star Game yep. uh, and do some different things here. But thank you for spending some time here. All right, we're going to focus a lot on going forward. And obviously, uh, the World Cup coming up in November and December. You can yep. see it all here on Fox. We are 123 days away wow. from the World Cup. I mean, it's going to come, uh, it's it's gonna gonna come, come like, that. like that. But I do want to take you back a little bit. Okay. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this uh, last night. Yeah. Last three years for everybody have been strange uh, and difficult and challenging. Best laid plans and everything from a U.S. men's national team perspective. Uh, Is there a strange silver lining in what has happened over the last three years in terms of what you wanted to do, um, what you could do, who you could play, all those different things that has come out of the, let's call it the COVID era? I think so. Um, when When I look at the first year, we played 19 games. So we used 2019 to lay the foundation. 2020, we only played four games. But what happened during that time is our young player pool got a year older. And they played their games with their clubs and and kept developing. So when we turned to 2021, when we started qualifying, and we ended up playing 23 games that year, we had a more mature player pool. And it gave us the the ability to choose a whole different group of players that have qualified and would have started earlier. We may not have selected those guys. The uh, national team has changed <laughs> a lot over the years, and certainly back when we were. You were telling me you guys have a barber that we travels do. with the team. Yeah. Does he do your? He does. Really? He takes too long, but he's <laughs> he's quality. It's one How of those long things. How it possibly take to I do mean, this? Th- I mean, I think the same thing. It takes me about ten minutes. It takes him a, an hour. But what I'll say is, it, again, it comes back to the the good food and, and the quality. Is it's about the detail. And, and this guy's fading it up, you know, they call it a skin fade. And I mean, it, it looks nice. I come out of there. You look I, great. You I look come great. out of there feeling better. I'll tell well, you that you look much. good. You look yeah. good. Uh, Coach, with there being so little time from when players are going to be released from their clubs yep. and then the start of the World Cup, you play yeah. on the opening day. Does that mean you almost have to treat that September window as a pre-World Cup camp and already have your 26 more or less in mind for that? Uh, uh, sort of. I mean, the the only um, difference is it's in reality it's not a pre World Cup camp. So you could play, you could call a couple guys maybe into camp that you know that you want to see that are in your plans, but maybe not um, concrete guys. But I think more importantly, you, you set you use the September camp to kind of lay the the foundation for the World Cup. You have goal setting meetings, you know, do a do a whole bunch of things like there that you're not going to have time to do once you get into Qatar. U.S. men's national team back at the World Cup uh, after missing the last cycle. Uh, in my estimation, the biggest failure in U.S. soccer history. You and this team, uh, I think, fairly are being looked at with um, open eyes and uh, you know a lot of excitement about what this team can do. I think every national team coach that has gone to a World Cup has been asked this question. I'm so going to ask you because there's going to be a lot of people that maybe haven't watched in a while that are going to come into the tent yeah. and see this this U.S. men's national team. Can the, this U.S. men's national team win the 2022 World Cup? Wow. I, I like how you asked it also. <laughs> Difficult way to ask it. What I would say is we're, we're going into the World Cup focused on 
first and foremost, getting out of the group. We're almost looking at the World Cup as two separate tournaments. And the way that you get to this knockout tournament, the special tournament, is by getting through this group phase tournament. And top two teams will go, and that's, that's first and foremost, that's our primary goal. And that's not easy to do. So take Germany as an example. Defending champs in 2018, they're in a group with Sweden, Mexico, and South Korea. What place did they finish in their group? Last. Last. So that's, I mean, we have to really take this group stage as earning the right to go to the knockout stage. And that's the, gotta be our focus. And once you get to the knockout stage, I'm a firm believer that on any given day, if we play our best game, we can beat anyone in the world. And then you just have to see how it goes. You know, I'm, you know that, that's gonna be our mentality going into the tournament. Last three defending champions have gone out on the group stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. World Cup. Uh, one more timing question. With the World Cup being in, in November and December, when you're comparing an MLS player to a European-based player, does that affect the calculus in terms of fitness? One group is going to be in the middle of the season, the other going to be at yeah. the end of the season. So if it's close between an MLS and a European player, might that be a determinant factor one way or the other? I think it's game time, um, how they're performing. But there, we're going to have to make special considerations for guys in Major League Soccer that are in the group and are out of the playoffs. We're going to have to accommodate that. Um, we need to get them fit. Huge part of success at the World Cup is fitness and we know we're gonna to have to be a fit team. Uh, so much, I think, good debate focuses on your selection. I mean, there was a time where it just kind of picked itself, uh, and now, when you put your roster out, there's incredible debate and criticism, and I like it, I don't like it, and then, when you put out your 11 for a game day, everyone's like, oh, why isn't this player playing? I mean, these are, as Tata Martino, your friend, would say, these are champagne problems in terms of the depth uh, that you have when it, when it, when it comes to uh, these players. So let's get into a little bit about the players that we are, are going to see. Uh, already we're seeing a bunch of moves here uh, when it comes to, and I, you know, I, can, I can read the list if you, if you want, just to remind people, because I, I think it's really interesting and I think it's really important. I think I have it here, yeah, okay. So Brendan Aronson, Tyler Adams, Matt Turner, Cameron Carter-Vickers, P. Falk, Horvath, De La Torre, Stefan Richards, all of these players are making moves right now. Are you happy with these moves and do you think that these moves are their way of doing everything possible to be on that plane to Qatar, and I guess more importantly for some of these guys to actually be on that starting 11. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's two sides. The first side of it is there, hap there is a World Cup a couple months away, 123 days away, that the guys are focusing on, they're preparing for. The other side of it is they have careers, and a large portion of their playing is going to happen in their club careers, right? 90% of their, their professional games are going to happen from their club, club career. So they have to take that serious and they have to make moves that they think is in best interest of their careers, the longevity of their careers, the, the earnings and, and all those things. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be at the forefront of their decision. We can't be. But what's, what, what I really like is when those two things are aligned, mm -hmm. right? When the guy's best interest of his career is also aligned with best interest of the national team. And when you see a guy... I think, you know, use Zach Steffen as an example of Ethan Horvath. They're clearly going places to get game time and to get uh, and to play. And that's why I like when I see stuff like that, because we need guys that are in form um, as we go into the World Cup. But if Zach Steffen had not made that move, right. or if Brendan Aronson had not made that move, right. would your perception of that player be different? I mean, let's take Br Brendan Aronson, for, right, yeah. for example. In the next four right. months or so, is he going to be that much different of a player that's going to change your yeah, mind? Yeah, no. Him? This is a good. This is a good um, conversation because I do believe that you know he's playing in the Austrian Bundesliga for a dominant team in the Austrian Bundesliga. He's a young player, so I think we could all agree that he's there's still this development that needs to take place in his game, right? He's taking a step up now, big step up, and now it's gonna it's gonna be a real. Um, a real good experience to see how he develops at Leeds and what he can do in the Premier League because that's the best league in the world. It's not the Austrian Bundesliga anymore. So it is, I mean, we're going to be watching him carefully and hopefully he, do, he does a great job, but there, it is going to be um, interesting to see how he, he progresses at Leeds. On that point, how do you contextualize what players do in Europe versus MLS or in top European leagues versus second or third tier European leagues? To what degree is the quality of the domestic league they're playing in factor into your decisions? That's obviously a big topic among US fans when it comes to comparing European yeah. MLS players and MLS guys. How much of that is an overall factor? If a guy is crushing it in MLS 
and another guy's just doing okay in the Premier League, but wait a minute, it's the Premier League versus MLS. How much does right. that factor into your decision making? We, we look at strength of leagues, and, and that's how we, um, we, we base what the players are doing um, and, and how they're performing. Uh, it, there, it is a big difference if a guy's performing um, in the Premier League at a really high level compared to the Portuguese First League. And we, we have to take that into consideration. And that's why there's been times where we call guys into camp um, from the Premier League that may not be getting regular game time because even the quality of their practice is really high. When you're at Man City and you're Zach, for example, the shots you're facing in training are a different caliber than guys um, in different leagues. All right, uh, Wales first, yep. then England, and then Iran. If you look at it from a strategic perspective, you already said you're kind of taking it as two different yeah. challenges and tournaments yeah. here. Where are we getting the points and how are we getting out of the group? So what I've learned is that, um, you know, any preconceived notion that we have of where we're going to get the points is probably not going to turn out like that. I mean, that's just how soccer is, right? So I think we can beat any team and we can lose to any team. So now it's about how do we focus one game at a time? How do we have solid game plans? How do we put the right players on the field in each and every game to try to be successful? Um, the opening game, you know the, the stats about if you win the, the first game, the group stage, you have a what, 65% chance of going to the next round or 70% chance. That's a big game. That's a big game for us. And um, you know we know Wales is a solid team, athletic team. They don't give much up at the back. It's going to be a very difficult game. Probably play five in the back. So, I mean, we're going to be focused on that game. And then England is, you know, is going to be, you know, this small American group against the billion dollar squad. That's what it's going to be. And, and, you know, we had that battle before, right, back in, in, the, in the 1700s. And, and we came up uh, on top. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, it's going to be something like that. I mean, can you imagine playing England in the World Cup, right? It's an amazing event. And then Iran's going to be a dangerous team, um, also a physical team, well organized, and um, it will be difficult to beat. So, you know, our goal is to, to finish in the top two and keep moving. All games important, but you mentioned that England game. I think a lot of people are circling that on Black Friday. It has the potential to be, you know, one of the greatest games in terms of viewership and attention there. So, uh, if something remarkable and historic were to happen there, that would that would make us very, very happy as Americans and certainly over at Fox. Uh, before I, before I send it back to Masi here, so in particular on the field right now, uh, why is it that we haven't, I mean, you, you've lived through the era and played through the era and coached through the era of, you know, you go back to Eric Winalda and Brian McBride and Josie Altador. Why is that number nine striker position in this moment where there's so much depth and so much talent been so hard to come by? I don't know. You don't know? No. No idea. It's nothing that we have done. It's just from a development standpoint. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when, even when I look at, I mean, you just saw the U twenties qualify for the Olympics and won the the Concacaf championship, and you know they're playing with Paxton Aronson as a number nine. So you're wondering, even at that level, where where are number nines? Uh, it's um, you know I don't know what happened along the way in in development that you know that position isn't consistently being produced. I know a lot of countries in the world have struggled with that before. Sure. France won the World Cup with, with um, Oliver Giroud not scoring a goal in the World Cup, right? So, I mean, I, I don't think it necessarily means that you can't be successful. And we have guys that interpret it, the number nine position in their own way that I think are very capable of doing it. We have some young potential players like Ricardo Pepe who's playing in the Bundesliga. I mean, let's not forget he's 19 years old, right? So he's still a young, young player. Jesus Ferrer, 21 years old. Still, they're still young players. That was actually going to be my next question. Yeah. We all seem to think Jesus has the inside track on that center forward spot right now. But as far as a plan B, would you be open to playing without a center forward? You mentioned Manchester City earlier. It's something they've yeah. done the last couple of seasons. Some combination of Pulisic, Timmy Way, Reyna, Aronson, where there isn't a true nine or even a false nine. It's just different guys floating in and out of that position. Yeah, we always work back from how we're going to score goals. And if, if we can envision a way that we can score goals consistently without a number nine, we would look at it. But for us, it's, you know, more often than not, we need guys arriving in the penalty box. You need to put pressure on the defense. You need to get balls behind the defense in front of goal. And a lot of times you need a number nine to, to finish that off. Uh, in America, it comes down to winning. We understand yes. that. You understand that just like anybody else. But since you've taken over this team, I think you came in and, correct me if I'm wrong, but you wanted to do something different. And I actually think that in, in many ways you have. The way that this team plays, the philosophy that 
that, that you have and that you have imparted on this team has been different. How much have you changed as a coach? And again, it goes back to best laid plans and the reality of the situation. How much have you changed and how much of that, for lack of a better word, romance have you had to kind of put away and just do whatever you possibly can to get results and to win? I know qualifying yeah. is different than a World Cup, but. Yeah, I think my, my mindset has changed. And if, um, if I came into the job, you know, thinking 50% of, of how we play is important and 50% of winning is important, I think, you know, maybe that shifted to 35% of how we play is important and 65% of, of winning and being successful is important. But not only that, I think it's, you know, I've got to learn the player pool a lot more. We've got to really take advantage of the strengths of the player pool. And if you think about how this team has progressed from 2019 till now, our pressing has completely changed. You know, we, we were pressing, we started out pressing in a 4-4-2, mid-block, conservative press, good, you know, compact shape, very difficult to break down. Now we're in a 4-3-3, high pressing, taking advantage of the athletes that we have on the field. When you look at guys like Tyler Adams and Weston McKinney and Eunice Musa and and some of these players, I mean, you, we have to unleash them. We have to give them the freedom to use their, their skills in the right way. And part of that is defensively, letting them be aggressive pressing. In the midfield, in this last window, you were playing around with different alternatives. Sometimes you and had Adams and, and, up, yeah. and Acosta playing as a six with two eights. Yeah. At other times, it seemed like uh, Eunice was dropping back, playing alongside yeah. Adams, and then yeah. you had a 10, usually Aronson. At the World Cup, is that just going to depend on matchup situations, who the opponent is? Yeah, I mean, part of that was to give Tyler support and build up. Um, and, you know, he's, as, as every player is developing, um, I think when we played with one player there, it was easy for the opponent just to man Mark Tyler and make it very difficult for him to get the ball and advance the attacks. What we started to do is putting two players there that it was more difficult for them to, to key on. And if they wanted to bring an extra player up, it freed up spaces between the, between the midfield and back line. All right, let's go through an 11. And I, I don't want you to give away yeah. what you don't want to give away <laughs> here, but you, know, you already mentioned Zach Steffen. So I think there is a real competition in goal, Definitely. right? Correct? Definitely. Definitely. Okay, if you are talking to your goalkeepers, and you know, it can include Horvath, it can include uh, Johnson, and right. obviously Turner and, right. and Steffen right now. If you're talking to them, what are you telling them as to what is going to ultimately make that final decision as to who's going to be out there in goal? Their performance. Their performance with our team and their performance with their clubs. Um, you know, ver some key elements that are important for us is a goalie that can deal with, with crosses, deal with aerial balls um, on set pieces. Uh, it's also key to be able to organize the defense. It's also key shot stopping. It's also key building out of the back. So those four components are are really um, you know, areas that we look for in the goalkeeper. But if, if Sean Johnson is playing lights out and throwing up clean sheets and winning every single game and doing all that, you just said earlier that you do take into account where the person is playing, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is one thing that we still have to consider, right? If, if Zach and, and Ethan are playing in the championship and playing every week, how does that compare to what Sean's doing? And that's just watching the games and watching the level of the games. And if Matt's playing, you know, the odd game in the cup, what does that mean? One thing that uh, I'm pretty comfortable with is we saw a lot of growth with Zach in his first year at Man City. So he went from MLS to, to the top club in the world and he really did improve even though he wasn't playing a lot of games. So we're hoping that Matt's gonna ha get that similar bump going to the next level at the, um, in the Premier League. All right, we know that there's injuries and all that kind of stuff. When you go in your back four, I'm gonna put Dest on the right, I'm gonna put Jedi on the left, and then your center backs, obviously with the, uh, the injury to, uh, to Robinson, that opens up an opportunity there. Walker Zimmerman, I'm gonna put him in there. Uh, Who's that other? Pro Why do you hate John Brooks? You hate, you don't you don't hate John Brooks, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come uh, on, people. But there are people uh, out there who are saying, well, where is John Brooks in all yeah. this? Yeah. So the first thing, I mean, to tell you guys, there has never been anything personal with John Brooks. Uh, there's I visited him a number of times at Wells Fargo. We have a number of phone conversations. Continue to have dialogue. That's that, you know, there's never been anything personal. For us, it's been about. Um, you know, what he's doing with us on the field, what he's doing with his club on, on the field. And that's, all, that's the only, only thing that, that we're looking at. Um, so if you go to some other center backs, you know, it's a real shame Miles Robinson got hurt. He was a breakout player in my mind in 2021. And, um, you know, you feel terrible for a guy like that to get that injury in the World Cup year. 
But then you have guys, um, you know, Cam Carter Vickers, who came in and did a, a, a good job in, um, in June. You have Aaron Long, who's, who's been a force in this team, very good leadership qualities. You have Chris Richards, who, you know, could be on his way to the Premier League or is on the way to the Premier League. It's going to be interesting to see what he does. And you have Walker Zimmerman. I mean, those are, those are three guys. Some guys that have, are a little bit further away, but, you know, still evaluate are Eric Palmer Brown, who's playing in League One, Mark McKenzie, who's playing in the Belgium Top League. So there's a number of players. And for us, it's about getting the combination right, both from a leadership standpoint and what we ask them to do on the field. All right. We, we talked about the three in the mid in the midfield, and I don't think that's going to change. And, and injuries, but we have we, other guys. We have Kellen, you didn't mention. Know. We have Luca De La Torre, who's, sure. you know, been performing well. It's, it's, a, it's a strong midfield group. But then up top, Christian on the left. Wea on the right, and certainly some other options up there. And then we talked about the, the yeah. number nine. Would, you know, Gio Reyna, wonderful player, young player, inexperienced player, and obviously a player that has not shown a consistency to stay healthy. And if he is healthy, and if he is there, where, what position do you see him playing in your 11? I think he could be a, a winger that plays between the lines, so not a vertical winger or he can play one of the attacking midfield positions. But you wouldn't play him up in the striker position as a false I mean, position. You know, I've, we haven't done that, you know, and I don't think it's, you know, it's necessarily time in the World Cup to be experimenting with, with a, a very young player in right. a new position. But you never know. You never know. Maybe Dortmund plays him there. I don't think they're going to, but maybe we can get some footage by what he's doing with his club. But my guess is... Um, you know, he'll play either as an attacking midfielder with Dortmund or as an internal winger. But that means, and this is a good problem to have, yep. that somebody has to come out. So yes. if you play for, in Christian's position, Christian has to come. But you play in Wales' right. position, yeah. somebody's going to come out. But good, that's great. Good, good decisions. No, to it's great. I mean, think about the options you have. You, you didn't even, we didn't even mention Jordan Morris, Brendan Aronson, Paul Ariola, Christian Pulisic, Tim Weah, Malik Tillman, Gio Reyna. I mean, though, that's options. That, that's pretty good. Mentioned center forward. Another problem spot is that backup left back position. You, you've even talked about that being an area of a little bit of concern. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, it, how concerned are you about that in the next few months? Are you really hoping that somebody emerges and really grabs that? Well, ideally, it'd be nice to see you know guys like George Bello really kick on and play every week in in the the second Bundesliga. It'd be nice to see Sam Vines um, you know break into to his team and have a consistent starting role. Um, but you know if they don't. You know, it's not, um, I, I think we could look at something like playing one of the right right footers on the left side. It's, you know, it's done all the time and, and we'd look to do something like that. Uh, with this role comes scrutiny and we've talked about it and, and criticism and, yeah. and I know you you have grown, but you also have become a, a star um, in your in your own right for everything that you do, whether it's your you know, wonderful haircuts or your incredible shoes. How, how, what are we looking at here, by the way, shoes-wise? What are you wearing here? I you design know? these myself. You design these? Yeah, what do you guys think? What do they have? I'd like, say they have a USA type yeah. of so Now, check these aren't $7,000. No, like these the aren't $7,000. What do you do after you wear a $7,000 pair of shoes? I don't what have do you do a $7,000 oh, pair of shoes. <laughs> what, what do you got? What? I, I keep it under under a certain amount. All right. And then do you just wear them once and then put them away, or do you actually? No, I wear them all the time. These are functional. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'm not one of those guys that keeps it on the shelf and polishes them. I wear right. them. I'm right. aware okay. them. Well, good. I, yeah. I, I, I pulled out the only pair of shoes that I had uh, here that even look halfway cool and uh, decent. Adidas was nice enough to give me, uh, give me these. Um, the, the criticism that any national team yeah. coach faces, yeah. how have you changed personally? Because, you know, there's slings and arrows and barbs that are, uh, yeah. that are out there. Do you, do you hear it? Do you feel it? Sometimes it's the family that takes the, yeah. the, the, brunt, uh, the brunt of it. And how have you changed in terms no, of No, I just, that? I realize it's part of the job, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, I, I think at first in 2019, I took it personally. I'm like, oh my gosh, what, you know, why are people saying this and this? And then now it's, it's something where I understand the responsibility of this job. I understand the spotlight that this job comes with. I also understand that Americans want to see winners. And, and, you know, we're focused on winning every single game we play in and competing in every single game we play in. And I think as we shifted that mindset, you know, as long as we're doing everything we can and we're working as hard as we can for this country to be successful, I can live with it with, with anything else. And, you know, I've become more thick skinned and just deal with it. Anything before we go? I have uh, one last question. Yep. It seems like every day this summer was the anniversary of a famous World Cup moment. Yeah. And a few weeks ago, we had the 20 year anniversary of Germany, USA, yep. quarterfinal 2002. Yep. It would have been your goal. Yep. Thorsten Frings blocks it yep. with his hand. Hugh Dallas somehow doesn't yeah. give the penalty. There was no VAR. How many times a day do you think about that play? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, you know, I, we were talking about it a little bit yesterday at dinner. And 
I don't think about it much, but I, I reflect on that tournament and I think about, you know, if we have to go out and we have to lose in, in a game, you want to lose playing a very good game. And that's what we did. And so we, we, we lost with our heads high and, and that's all you can do. Even when we go into this tournament, when we get to the knockout round, you know, we're just focused on playing our best possible game. And if we lose the game, we lose the game. I know you're a, a fan of sports. You mentioned you're here for the uh, Major League uh, Baseball yeah. All-Star Game. I know you play other sports. You play basketball. Your, your basketball skills <laughs> have become legendary at this point. Where did this all start? By the way, I think we have a ball here. So we, we want to we make sure that we understand this and we, yeah. we break this down. Yeah, Obviously, let's break it down. It's, uh, so where did the whole thing of the behind-the-back pass and the, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, Burhalter bounce. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? All right, so I'm going to show you something right here. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, 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 you yeah, want to yeah. take a throw in. Right. You want to take a throw in, right? right. Okay. You're going to take the throw. I'm going to take the throw. So I throw it like that. Okay. Now, what do you have to do? Okay. Okay. Now, I do it like this. Now, what's easier to get the throw in quicker? Got it. Okay. So you're using the bounce to exactly. inertia to exactly. come back. It gives it's it, exactly. One Instead big of thing. them having to go like that. that and, and exactly. That, right? so, so now you go like that, and it's... Right there. Okay, but now the what speed about the of getting the, the ball? Back? What do we look? So you just again, it's a, time it's, or it's, all stopped? it's a speed. So if I'm getting the ball here, if it's coming out of bounds there, oh, this ball's a little dead. You're gonna. It's you're all right. But, you know, <laughs> so if, if it's coming out of bounds there, it's it's something like that. Oh wow! Right. That okay. you got to get it in quickly, any way possible. All right. Do you find yourself now thinking about different ways, uh, or do you, do you want to curtail it too much? As you know. No, I'm just trying to get it in play as quickly as possible. You are. Yes. Uh, the, speaking of getting in, getting in place. Wilson Ball, what is this? I don't know. This is, from it, Castaway? We <laughs> <laughs> found this, oh found this ball. Wait, ask Tom Hanks. Let's give Tom Hanks his ball back. <laughs> I know we got to let you go here, but uh, speaking of getting the ball into play and speaking of, of set plays, I know that uh, you recently hired yeah. a set piece specialist. Mm -hmm. Near and dear to my heart. I love yep, uh, yep. set pieces. Yep. Uh, why did you do that? And how do you think it's going to pay uh, dividends? So in, in the World Cup, set piece goals are vital. Um, the teams that win the World Cup are very strong on set pieces. And, um, you know, we saw some inefficiencies in our own set piece game that we wanted to address. Uh, we bought an expert in that, in that field. His only responsibility is to track set pieces and, and focus on teaching set pieces to the group and then executing them. So, um, you know, we're excited about this person that has a lot of experience in that field, and we're hoping to get some gains from that. Tell America why they should watch this U.S. men's national team on Fox. You know, I think about just the group we have and the, the, the connection that this group has with each other and, you know, the, the spirit that they have to fight for the country. And I can guarantee you when, um, you know, when that whistle blows in the first game against Wales, you're going to see a team that's going to be fighting for our country. Amen, my friend. Best of luck. Thank you so much for joining us here today. The great Bre uh, Greg Burhalter. Thank you, Mossy, for hanging out. I think I learned a little bit. Did you learn a little bit? Uh, never let Stu Holden order. Or never, Denver. ever let Stu Holden. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining here on this special edition of the State of the Union podcast with our great guest, uh, Greg Burhalter. 123 days before you will see the U.S. men's national team and all the teams at the World Cup in Qatar. And uh, we cannot wait. It's going to be fun on and off the field. All right, we'll see you next time. And as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.